Hi, I'm Hans Hess. Thank you so much for joining me for my television program today. It's going to be great. We're going to get into the Word of the Lord. We're going to talk about Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. And we're going to talk about hearing the voice of God. And I'm going to give you some practical things you can do to start developing your sense of hearing from the Lord. I still believe God speaks today. Some believe He doesn't, but I believe fully God speaks today. He speaks through His Word primarily, but He's speaking to us by His Spirit as well. We're going to talk about it today. So open up your heart and listen to the sermon, and I'll be with you at the end. Are you there? Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. Be still. Come on, say it with me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Last week, I began a series called Hearing the Voice of God, and I talked about how we are wired to hear His voice, that God has created each one of us with the receptivity to hear His voice, that you were born a spirit being, you were born in the image of God, you were created to commune with God and to hear His voice. A lot of people believe God doesn't speak today, but I believe He still speaks today. Some people believe He only speaks through His Word. Well, He does speak through His Word, and that is the, the big way He speaks, obviously. But He also still speaks to us by His Spirit. He gives us guidance by His Spirit. He hasn't stopped doing that. I know if we ask for testimonies in this congregation, we could get many testimonies of how God has led you to do this or opened a door for you or spoke to you something in prayer or spoke to you through a friend or you received a prophetic word or something. Somehow God has led you through your life and I believe He still speaks today. So today I want to talk about how we can be properly positioned to hear the voice of the Lord. We must be in the right place, the right, uh, the right frame of mind, so to speak, to hear from the Lord. So let's talk about it. First, and I only have two things I want to say today. They're very simple, so just grab hold of them. Number one is be still. Be still. Come on, say it with me one more time. Be still. God wants us to take time to be still before Him. God wants us to take time, cut away some time out of your day to be still before the Lord. Take some time to pray Take some time to get into the Bible or listen to the Bible. Take some time to meditate on God. If you're not doing anything right now, then anything that you can give is going to be good. Amen. Five minutes, ten minutes, anything you can cut out of your schedule is going to be good. One man said, well, I, it seems like the Lord always speaks to me while I'm jogging. And another guy said, because it's the only time you're quiet. Or people, God speaks to me while I'm in the shower. Yeah, because you're not talking and TV's off and you're not holding on to the phone. You're, you're still before the Lord. And that's how God wants us to be. He wants us to get in a position to where we can listen for Him. And once you do that and then condition your spirit to sitting before the Lord in quiet or in prayer or in His Word, when you condition your spirit to doing that, then I believe God can speak to you anytime He wants to. It's kind of like you've invested the time in it, and now you can make a withdrawal at any time that God, God wants to. I and mean, God can speak to you sometimes when you're mopping the floor, when you're driving the truck, when you're working at, at a business. God can just speak to you. But I believe it requires spending time in His presence and getting before His face. And I don't know what that looks like for you. It might be different for you than it is for me. It might be different for someone else in here. I know people that pray, and it's, I mean, they're sweating, and they're shouting, and they're getting at it. And I know people that sit real quiet before the Lord. I had a friend I used to pray with, and uh, he had been a missionary. And this guy had one of the 
most unique prayer lives ever. God had really called him to be an intercessor to Washington, D.C. And so he had an apartment up uh, overlooking the Iwo Jima Memorial, and we would go up in his apartment, and he had like these 10-foot glass windows and doors, and you could see all of Washington before you. It was the most incredible view of any city I've ever seen. You could see the Washington Monument and the planes going by to Reagan. You could see the Lincoln Memorial, and he would just sit up there and pray over the city, and he never closed his eyes. I don't know if you've ever prayed with anyone who never closes their eyes, but it's kind of weird. But I, it's not in the Bible that we have to close our eyes anywhere. But I'd be praying with him and every now and then be like, and he's sitting there going, yes, Lord. <laughs> People pray differently. Amen? The important thing is, that you get a hold of God. H. Richard Hall, who me and Jackie were ordained under years ago, he said he was out as a young minister praying in the woods, and he was crying out, Oh, God! He was crying out in the woods. And all of a sudden, it about scared the life out of him, but a police officer came up and asked him if he was okay. <laughs> and he said, Son, don't you know uh, God isn't deaf? He said, Nobody's a long way from here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you pray like that. Maybe you get into the shout mode. I don't know. Cut away some time and be still and hear the voice of God. I want to read you some scriptures. Just hang on here because I want this to get into our spirits. Mark chapter 1, the Bible says, at once the Spirit sent Jesus out into the desert and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Jesus at the inauguration of his ministry was led into solitude to spend 40 days there undergoing temptation, but also really preparing him for what he was getting ready to walk into. Luke says he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. He came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And then he went to Nazareth, his hometown, and he read from the scroll of Isaiah saying, Now the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's three spirit texts all about the anointing coming on him after being in solitude and enduring temptation. Mark chapter 1 verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 5:15. Despite Jesus' plea that his miracles be kept secret, the Bible says the news about him spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Mark 2.13, once again Jesus went out beside the lake. Some of us have been there, the, the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. He would often go out by the lake and it's like he wanted to be alone. And he was trying to get away from the crowds to get out there. Mark chapter, Luke chapter 6 verse 12. Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. And he spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples and he chose 12. And even though he was the son of God, and even though he worked in the spirit without measure, nonetheless, before great decisions, he spent time in prayer. He spent all night in prayer before choosing the 12 disciples. Matthew 13, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Again, there's something about going out and sitting by the lake. And such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. And while all the people stood on shore, he taught them many things in parables. Matthew 14, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. Mark 6.31, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Matthew 14, and Jesus dismissed the crowds, went up on a mountainside by himself to pray, and when evening came, he was there alone. Mark 7, 24, Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. Luke 9, 18, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, 
Who do the crowds say I am? If you remember this text, it was from Caesarea Philippi where he went away to basically get away from the crowds. Mark 9, 2, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone and there he was transfigured before them on the Mount of Transfiguration. John 7, 10, after his brothers had gone out of the feast, then Jesus also went up, not publicly, but private to the feast, which means Jesus probably walked the 90-mile journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, which gave him about five days in total solitude. Luke 11, 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. It's like the disciples are here, and they're seeing Jesus over here by himself praying, and they're thinking, we need this. <laughs> we need to know how to do this. Luke 10, verse, I mean, John 10, rather, verse 39. Again, the religious leaders in Jerusalem sought to arrest Jesus, but he escaped their hands and he went away again, again walking about five miles journey across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing and there he remained by himself. Mark 10, 32. They were on the way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Apparently Jesus kept silent for this 22 mile journey. Because Luke says that he was resolute in Luke 9.51. He told them that he, had be, he would be tortured and killed. And so the scene and the atmosphere of the text is that he is silent and resolute as walking this 22-mile journey with his disciples. The Bible says Jesus went out after singing a hymn on the Mount of Olives to a usual place to pray. A usual place where he would get along with the Father and pray. Mark 14, 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus told his disciples, sit here while I pray. Why, why did I read all these texts? Because we often think of Jesus as a man among the people, which he was, and we think of his miracles and his teaching, but we, don't, we often read over or gloss over all of the time he spent in solitude and prayer. I believe what allowed him to be in public was the time he spent in prayer with the Father. And you, may, you and I may say, yeah, but we're just too busy. Busier than Jesus? Or I, I really don't need that much time in solitude. You, you don't need it as much as Jesus did? Or I don't really have to pray about major decisions. I know exactly what I want to do. But Jesus prayed about major decisions? If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you and I. How many want to be like Jesus? I want to be like the Master, don't you? And this, this preaches conviction to me, church, that I need to spend more time in solitude and be still and know that God is who He says He is. There's something about, you know, um, so if you, if you would go with me to Washington, D.C., I would take you to the National Mall, and we could walk the grounds of the National Mall. We could see the Washington Monument, the uh, Lincoln Memorial, the, the reflecting pool, the, you know, all of the Smithsonian Museums, walk all the way to the Capitol. And if you do that, the walkways through the National Mall are filled with gravel, a rock-like and so if you walk it, you know, you're walking in this gravel and you're crunching, but I never remember listening to myself walk through the National Mall. Why? Because there's so much action going on. There's so many people going past me. There's so much activity. I don't think about listening to my footsteps. Yet a few days ago, I was up at 4,000 feet in western North Carolina hiking. And I was by myself. And I heard every footstep. I heard every branch that broke under my hiking boots. I heard every movement in the woods. What's the difference between me in the woods and me in D.C.? It's I'm alone. And when you're alone and in solitude, everything is heightened to you. You can hear now. Come on, some of you hunters know what I'm talking about. You get out in the woods, you can hear, and you're, you're, you're attuned to everything that's happening. I'm telling you, modern society and technology, I thank God for it, but it's worn us out. 
It's absolutely worn us out. If you've got to keep up with all the social media, keep up with your phone, keep up with what's going on in seven news channels, and now the news channels have stocks running here, headlines running here, time up here, logo right here. I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, what's going on with this? It's cool now because I've got to have all that now. But we're so worn out by technology, do we ever take time to just quieten it down and get alone with the Lord? Maybe it's drinking a cup of coffee on the back porch in the morning and talking to Jesus. Maybe it's sitting in that Jesus chair in your house with the Bible and you're reading your daily devotions. I don't know. Maybe it's listening to a podcast on your way to work that's a devotional thing. I don't know. Whatever. Maybe it's getting together with two or three guys, sometimes you men, and praying with one another at times, or you ladies. It's whatever it is, you've got to cut away some time to spend before the Master. Dallas Willard, who was a, he's now passed away, but he said this. He said, many people say, I don't have time for extensive solitude and silence. I have too much to do. Willard said, the truth is you don't have time not to practice solitude and silence. No time is more profitably spent than that used to heighten the quality of an intimate walk with God. If we think otherwise, we've been badly educated. The real question is, will we take time to do what is necessary for an abundant life and an abundant ministry, or will we try to get by without it? Amen. He said there's two facts. The first is, God never gives us too much to do. We do that to ourselves. Second is, to walk in ministry and walk in power, God requires two things, character and Holy Spirit anointing. If you only have the anointing of the power of God and no character, you're going to be a Samson or a Saul and you're going to break and you're going to fail at some point. But if you have character and no time before the Lord to develop the power, then you're not going to be as effective as you could be. What we want is both power and character working together. Gifts and fruit working together in our lives, and that's only developed by spending time before the Master. Amen. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Amen. I'm going to challenge you. Find 15 minutes this week on a daily basis to get along with the Lord. Amen. Whatever it is. Lunch break, morning, maybe you're a nighttime person. Whatever it is, I just want to challenge you. 15 minutes where you shut everything down and just get before the Lord. I'm telling you, man, I feel like, I think it was Martin Luther who said, I've got a lot to do today, so I better get up an hour early so I can really seek the Lord in prayer. To spend that time before His face. Sometimes I'm seated, and I look like an ancient monk praying before the Lord. Sometimes I'm, I'm eating carpet and face down. praying. Sometimes I'm walking. I don't know, sometimes I'm on my knees. Sometimes I'm seated in a chair with a cup of coffee. Praise Jesus. Listening for the voice of God. Because I'm telling you folks, one word from God can change your entire life. One word of direction from Him can change your entire trajectory in life. One moment of favor that you recognize because you spent time in His presence can change your family forever. I'm telling you, there's an opportune moment God's going to bring before you and have you sharpened your sense of hearing Him to an, an, enough of an acuteness that you can really respond when He speaks to you. This is where I'm at right now. I just want to hear His voice and do what He says do. That's where I'm at. I, the programs we know, the education I've been through, the you know we've said done church for years, and I, I just want to hear His voice and do what He says do. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. Second thing I want to tell you today is we need to. This is going to sound weird, but I'm going to explain it. We need to watch to hear. We need to watch to hear. Habakkuk chapter two. Verse 1, 
Habakkuk said, I will stand my watch. Okay, he's going to get up on the city walls or, or take his post like a military soldier. I'm going to stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he'll say to me. And what will I answer when I'm corrected? Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tables that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but, the end, it will, but in the end it will speak. It will not lie, though it tarries. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So this term, watch to see, is actually I'm going to lean forward, looking into the distance, straining myself to see and hear what God is saying do. Amen. I'm going to take my time to do this. I'm going to properly position myself to hear the voice of God. Okay, let me give you two things. These are so simple, but they're profound, and I'm going to give you homework to do. Number one, God speaks. Now, God speaks through dreams and visions and words from people and counsel from wise folks and through His Word. God speaks through many ways. I'm talking about our personal time with Him right now. How does He speak to me in my heart? How does He speak to me? I'm going to give you two ways. And it's all about watching to listen. Number one, he speaks through vision. Now, I'm, I, I, I'm talking, he speaks through mental images that come in the theater of your mind. He speaks through vision. I, I know this may sound kooky to some of y'all, but just hang on. God can show you images that appear in your mind's eye and sometimes it's the Spirit of the Lord showing you something. Amen. Now, most of my examples of this are from ministry because that's what I've done for the past 32 years of my life. So I'm going to give you some examples from ministry, but God can do the same thing in your personal life. Okay? Uh, I'm praying for someone at a church one time, and I see this, and I see someone digging a grave with a shovel. And I go and minister to this person. I said, I see someone digging a grave. Boom. And I started ministering. And I thought it was all figurative. It was all type and shadow. It was just a prophetic vision. But they, the guy kind of starts crying. And somebody comes up to me and said, he just lost his dad. And they just buried his dad. And I thought, oh, Lord, I know what you're doing. And that's why it's dangerous sometimes to add to the vision with our interpretation. Just let it be what it is and just write it down as it is or just tell it as it is or just receive it as it is and ask God for the interpretation. Because I, I just, God was just showing me where this guy was at in his life. It was a prophetic thing, but it came to me as a picture in my mind. This often happens when I'm traveling as an evangelist praying for people in altars. It'll happen a lot. Sometimes I'll pray for folks and I don't know them. Maybe that helps. I don't know them, and then I'll see an image, and I'll often just share the image and go on. My wife, Jackie, received this kind of prophetic revelation a lot. I remember we were one time, uh, I was preaching for a guy in central Virginia, and uh, we were at lunch with the pastor one day, and he says, he says, I'm having an issue with someone in my church. And Jackie says, they're involved with a man. And I see the man. This is what he looks like. And he wears a necklace, and this is exactly what the necklace looks like. And that pastor was like, he said, oh my gosh, you're exactly right. Jackie saw it as a picture that came before her at lunch. So I'm telling you, God can show you images. Again, being developed in your still time before the Lord. Soaking in His Word, soaking in His presence, having a heart to listen, to extend forward and watch and listen. You have that kind of heart. God can show you things that are directional in your life. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So what I want you to do is I want you to get a notebook. And I want you to start writing down some of these things you see in prayer. Just write them one sentence, two sentences. Write them down that you see in prayer. And then I want you to pray over it. And I want you to find someone who is spiritual in your life that you can open up to and ask them about it. 
Because I think the issue is sometimes we see things and we think, well, God, show me this. And you may be off, but no one's correcting you or helping you with it or mentoring you in it. And so then you go off on this what you've seen from the Lord. And I've seen so many people get shipwrecked because they've gone off of a word that they received and wouldn't take any correction or any kind of counsel on that word. No, God showed me this, bless God, and that's the way it is. And they would just go off on this. I'm just asking you in your private time, take a note. You say, well, I'm not good at writing. Get a phone that has voice notes. If someone starts prophesying over me and I can remember it, I bring out my phone and start recording it on voice notes. I have numerous prophetic words on my phone. I'll often preach to myself on my voice notes going down the road. Somebody shout amen. amen. I know I'm not preaching the house down this morning, but this is maybe better than me preaching the house down if you get it. Because it's going to change your life. He speaks through vision. Number two, he speaks through words. He speaks through a flow, a spontaneous flow of thought. And it's going to come to you as your own thoughts. It's going to come to you as your own thoughts. Watch to hear. It's a weird wording there, but watch to hear. Stretch out to hear what God is saying to you. God may speak to you in vision. God may speak to you through a spontaneous flow of words. All of it within the boundaries of His Word, the Bible, but nonetheless God speaks in vision and in words. I just pray you take time to develop that and seek the Lord and let Him start speaking to you. Start listening to what He's saying. Listen, I want to close today by praying for you. If you have any needs, I want to pray for you right now. Let's just take them to the Lord in faith. Just extend your faith to God if you've never accepted Christ. I would love to pray a prayer with you so that you can accept Christ, be born again. Number two, if there's a healing need in your life, I want to pray for that right now. So extend your faith. Pray with me right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I accept you into my life, Lord Jesus, as Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me of all sin. And thank you for this new life that I now have. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray for all those who need a miracle. I pray that you minister right now, God. Heal bodies, touch people's minds, touch their hearts, God, right now in Jesus' name. And do a miracle. And we believe you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Love you guys. Such an honor to come to you. I'll see you next week, same place, same time. It's gonna come. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun.